Well, thanks for introducing me, Diane. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor. I'm honored to be with all your guests, and I fully support your candidacy. Um, would you like me to share my screen and start my presentation now? Yes, please. Okay. They can. So this is a picture of a, a large thermonuclear weapon from a distance of 50 miles that would be similar to what you would see being detonated in a nuclear war with the US and Russia. And this is an image of the firestorm I mentioned. I put the picture over New York City to give people there an idea of how large one nuclear warhead would do. They would probably be a number of nuclear warheads that would be targeted in a place like New York. Um, you know, we have, the US and Russia have you know, only a few hundred cities, the population is greater than 100,000 people. So, you know, they've got plenty of warheads to go around. These warheads would be delivered uh, primarily, the launch ready warheads would be coming from intercontinental ballistic missiles. Those are long land based missiles, and they have about a 30 minute flight time going from the US to Russia or from Russia to the US. But they can also include submarine launched ballistic missiles. Uh, and if these uh, subs are parked off the coast of Russia or the US, they can hit targets uh, there in as little as seven to 10 minutes. Now, uh, a launch would be detected here by the North American Aerospace Defense Command. It's a picture of where it is in a, buried in a mountain. They're always busy 24 hours a day getting ready for a nuclear war. Uh, if they detect it, then what will they do? Well, the US and Russia have maintained a policy of what they call launch on warning for quite some time. What this means is if a, a nuclear strike is detected on early warning systems, <clears throat> we'll launch a retaliatory strike um, before the, the strike arrives, while the enemy, enemy missiles are in the air and before any nuclear detonation occurs. So a false warning of attack, if it's believed to be true, would make the retaliatory strike a nuclear first strike. In other words, accidental nuclear war. There's been many false warnings of attack in the past, but you know when you have uh, low levels of tension, um, they're less likely to be believed. But, you know, right now we don't have that. So missile flight times determine the time allowed to order a nuclear counterattack. A president must order a retaliatory missile strike that allows his missiles to launch, you know, uh, before the incoming nuclear warheads destroy them. So uh, it takes at least a few minutes for early warning systems to issue an attack warning. The people at NORAD are tasked to provide a warning within three minutes. And a missile attack by subs off the coast will allow only a few minutes of time to contact the president. You know, if you have seven minute, 10 minute time from a launch to impact, it doesn't give you very much time to evaluate it, have a threat conference and uh, figure out what to do. So you have three minutes to detect and confirm such an attack. Uh, then you would have a the president is contacted in the situation room if he's at the White House or somewhere else by a secure line overseas. And he has, with a sub attack, you'd have maybe 30 seconds to have a conference. You'd be told what's going on and what his options are to retaliate. And then he, he would, it takes, let's say, assume he gives the order to launch right then. It takes two to three minutes to give and transmit the launch order. It takes about two minutes for the ICBM, the intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, launch. To, to, to be launched and get out of harm's way. And it takes about 15 minutes for sub-missile launch. So, but just suppose a warning of attack was false. Um, I mentioned the nuclear, if the presidents are not at the White House, they're always followed by a nuclear suitcase. And it takes about one minute for those to order a launch. It's an automated communication device that connects the president to the National Command Authority. Now, this is um, what you would look like in Russia if they detected an attack. This is their NORAD. So I've, I wanted to mention that the Russian military can issue a launch order that bypasses all lower levels of command. They're ready to um, launch within 10 minutes. They, and not just the, the president, but also their uh, defense minister and the current uh, chief of the general staff has the nuclear briefcases there. They're all able to give the order. Russian military can follow the U.S. pattern of launch procedures, or they can order a, a remote launch. They can push a button and override all the lower subordinate chain of command and missile launch crews. You know, they're, they're threatened if they have a missile coming at Moscow and they have, you know, they might even have less than seven minutes. So they're streamlined to attack. Once these missiles are launched, it cannot be recalled. Um, if 
there is an attack, a full-scale war. This is an image created by scientists that did peer-reviewed studies that show what would happen. Each click is one day. Uh, the smoke rises into the stratosphere from nuclear firestorms. You know, uh, an 800 kiloton warhead creates 150 square mile firestorm. So, you know, 500 of those would probably create 50,000 square miles of nuclear fires. Um, the scientists estimate that 70% of the sunlight in the Northern hemisphere would be blocked from reaching the surface of the earth and about 35% in the Southern hemisphere. The smoke is above cloud level, cannot be rained out and it would relate, remain in the stratosphere for about 10 years. The first uh, one to three years, daily temperatures in Central North America and Eurasia would be below freezing. And after it would, it would be at least 10 years before the weather would be warm enough to grow crops. So most humans and animals would starve to death. Um, and I think that's probably all you need to see. 